How are y'all doing today? Welcome to Kingdom Night Restoration hey. Fellowship. It is a Wednesday night. We're still not mm -hmm. still not meeting a, you know in person at this point. So we are coming on together nights. on Wednesday nights. Yeah, but we are meeting on Shabbat. Amen. On the Sabbath, uh, Saturdays at one o'clock. Y'all are always welcome to join us. That's right. We are over at First Baptist Church in Morristown downtown on the Jackson Street entrance. Mm -hmm. You'll see one of our our flags out there to kind of mark the way in but we'd love to have you come and join us for fellowship one o'clock on shabbat it's the time of worship and uh and the teaching from the word amen so but tonight we are on the kingdom yes and uh, we've been looking at the kingdom as it appears in the the prophets and we've been going very slowly through the book of isaiah yes uh, we've really kind of hammered down on some of these different passages last week we were in isaiah chapter 63 we spent a lot of time talking about edom edom and uh, what all the place that that is and the geography of of things and how the messiah is moving with his his army so to speak mm -hmm. and coming through and how the nations are opposed to him uh, we're going to look at tonight Isaiah 65. Uh, these are the last, you know, 65 and 66 are the last two chapters from um, from the book. And uh, there are a lot of things in these chapters that come up on uh, in, in the New Testament and Paul's writings and different concepts. Um, even in chapter 64, it talks about, uh, you know, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are the work, we are all the work of your hand. And that's language that Paul, you know, draws from several times in his letters, from Romans to Corinthians to, uh, was it Second Timothy? Anyway, um, so he, he draws from several of these. And so we're going to open up in Isaiah 60, 65. Yes. And look at what it has to say about the kingdom. Uh, and Because tonight there's a lot of good stuff. Yes. About the kingdom. You know, uh, 63 and the discussion on Edom was stuff leading up to the kingdom, right? Right when he comes back, what is he going to do? Um, and how he goes to war against his enemies. 65 kind of focuses in a lot on the kingdom yes and uh and it's it's that's one of the things that makes the the topic and even looking at the at the prophets in such a challenge is that it's not necessarily linear right uh in its descriptions it, it is sometimes it goes back and forth past present future present future past it, it goes back and forth, and these subjects are interchangeable, and so it's easy to get bogged down or lost. Okay, wait a minute, which one are we talking about now? <laughs> and uh, so it's it makes it challenging to keep up with what exactly is he referring to at right. this particular place, and that's and that's okay. Uh, it's okay that it is difficult to keep up with. Um, so don't feel bad about those kinds of things. No, not at all. Uh, so when we are in Isaiah chapter 65, looking at the kingdom and the prophets, um, he starts out by saying this, and, and this first verse, I believe at least anyway, and I know that you'll probably find commentaries that will argue otherwise, but I, I believe this first verse sets some of the stage for what follows in the verses that follow. Uh, he says, I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. And that's, that's also kind of language that mm -hmm. Paul is using in the New Testament to describe a certain group of people. Yes. Do you remember what that certain group is? Gentiles. Yeah. He uses that kind of language. You know, these, this is, I will call and reach out to these that are not my people or are called not a people. Uh, and they have a, you know, a conscience. They, they do by nature things, you know, that they have a conscience that has them doing and living by things within the law, even though they never heard it before. Which is also something the prophet um, Hosea uses, mm -hmm. um, the picture that he uses and that Peter uses. Um, but in, in Hosea, he's referring to the northern kingdom of Israel. You know, I'm not going to call you my people. 
Well, now you'll be called my people, mm -hmm. right? I will not have compassion. Well, I will have compassion. So, I mean, you have these... You, you have these motifs within the prophets that m multiple ones of them use. And, of course, Paul, when he refers to the Gentiles in this way. It's in Romans chapter 10, by the way. Yes. Um, he's definitely talking about Gentiles. But at the same time, either way, whether it's referring to rebellious Israel or to Gentiles. Rebellious Gentiles. Yes, rebellious Gentiles. They were people who were not necessarily purposely and intently going after God necessarily. Yes. yes. So. so he says, I'm going to start over. I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, Hineni, Hineni, here I am. Here I am. And again, this, am. this is in some of these things of Romans <clears throat> chapter 10, 19 and 20 and such. Uh, he says, I said, Hineni, here I am, to a nation not called by my name. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a really, um, you know, like you said, there's a time where he describes Israel that way. Mm -hmm. and, and actually in chapter 64, he was just talking about Israel in terms of them being rebellious. Yes. So they were going in a direction he didn't want them to go. They were, and rebellion is intentional. Yes. Your rebellion is where well, you're you're going against what God has told you to do, what your Lord, what your master has told you to do, and you you are refusing to do that and instead you're doing something else. Going in the opposite direction. You know, there's sin, there's missing the mark. There's iniquity that uh takes truth and error and kind of intertwines them. And then there's transgression or outright rebellion. Okay? It says, I don't care what you say, <clears throat> I'm going to do what I want to do, mm -hmm. right? And that is very intentional. Mm -hmm. so. But he's saying this to a nation not called by my name. And ultimately, that, that I believe this is a passage that is talking about us. That's how Paul under, seems to understand it and interpret it in Romans chapter 9. I, I was sought that there are, there are those within the Gentiles mm. that are seeking after him, uh, in ways they may not even fully understand. So I was sought by those who did not ask for me, found by those who did not seek me. I said, Hineni, here I am. I'm going to reveal myself to you. you to know, a nation not called by my that's, name. That's real interesting because you, you think about our testimony, mm -hmm. right? And God teaching us many of, of these things within the Messianic life. Are you suggesting that we didn't go looking for well, this? We, we, were, we weren't looking for it. We didn't, go, we didn't go purposely looking for this stuff. It was We just started digging deeper into Scripture. And it wasn't, I will say this, you know, it, it, it took years of study. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't just a casual reading of Scripture. It was study, study, study. It was... Digging in, it was looking up word after word after word. It was staying up till all hours of the night, looking up words in scripture. And so, you know, I mean, it, 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 it in that sense, it became intentional, but we didn't necessarily go looking for a specific direction. Mm -mm. We were just digging into the word of God. We were trying to rightly divide the word of truth and trying to study to show ourselves approved. And and answer some of our own questions. Yes. Some of our own interpretational difficulties and with passages it's like, I don't know how that fits with my tradition, my faith background, my my Baptist upbringing or whatever right. else. And and so we were looking at different passages and and he slowly brought us to a messianic perspective over a course of 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. And as I was sharing with a, a friend of ours uh, Cal, the other day, you know, if if where I am now, if me now, you know, you're, there's those questions that you have. If you could go and talk to yourself when you were, you know, <laughs> graduating high school, what would you say? Well, you know, if me now went back to where I was in 2006 or 2007 and tried to tell him where I'm at and where you've gone, all of that, uh, me in 2006 and seven would have been like, I mean, no, I ain't going there. You know, I would have pushed back against that and said, there's no way. Because we definitely, I mean, it wasn't a, 
we saw everything all at once. Mm -hmm. It was a slow reveal through years of study. Yeah. So, uh, it, you know, young me would not have probably agreed with old me very much. <laughs> and, uh, th that's a lot of things I yeah. think, yeah. but you know, so, he, you know, God is, re is willing, you know, that it also kind of deals with that question of, well, what about the one, you know, out there in the, in the sticks somewhere who's never heard the name of Jesus? Uh, this passage, verse one in 65, you know, if someone is genuinely seeking after God and they are calling out to him with a, a true and real heart, is he going to respond to that? This verse suggests is yes, he will. Uh, I was found by those who did not seek me. You know, it's um, in a lot of ways he will he will reach out to those whom he knows has a heart for him. Uh, and he says to a nation not called by my name. Again, I'm 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 understanding that to be more of the Gentile people, but uh, not he, necessarily. But yeah, not, it's also rebellious Israel. I just want, I want to I want to make that clear. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So I have stretched out my hands all day to a rebellious people. And again, that also describes the Jewish people, mm -hmm. but it also describes the Gentiles who have walked away from God and his ways, uh, who walk in a way that is not good. They have a halakha that is not good. Not good by whose standards? Oh, by God's standards. By God's standards. He's the one who gets to determine what is good and what is evil. Yes. And that's important because, um, you know, a, a nation or a culture may approve of a lot of things. Yeah. They may have national uh, approval. They may have, this is, this is right and good by our culture and by our society. This is perfectly normal as we deem it. This is perfectly legal. Our Supreme Court has declared it so. Um, but he can still look at us and say, uh, they walk in a way that is not good. Right. Um, because regardless of what they approve, what the culture, what the society approves, if it does not conform to the word of God and what he approves, then guess what he's going to say about it? And anytime scripture talks about walking, it's talking about living. Yes. The way we, the way we live. Yes. Yes. The way we live with each other and the way we live with him and serve him. As he, as he spoke to Abraham, walk before me and, and be, be blameless. blameless. Mm -hmm. uh, so walking <laughs> is that, that manner of of how you live your life before God. Right. Uh, so again, regardless of what culture or society or anybody else says, God is the one who determines whether something is a good way or not. Um, so he says, I have stretched out my hand all day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own thoughts. What Mine they, says their own inclinations. Their own inclinations. Okay, I like that. Uh, these people provoke me continually to my face. You know, All the time. <laughs> yeah. Sacrificing <laughs> in gardens, burning incense on bricks, sitting among the graves, spending night in the, in the tombs. What, what kind of activities does this sound like so far? The, 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 the burning tombs, incense, the graves, bit, the burning incense. incense. It sounds like pagan. Sacrificing. Something. Yes, but they're calling it, They what do they think they're doing? Don't they think they are worshiping in some ways? I mean, if they're sacrificing... Yeah. Again, this is a people that have, have walked away from God. Yes, you but know, they're, now, they're worshiping whatever, whatever God they think they're out According to their own inclinations. Now, if this applies to Israel, if this is Israel, if this rebellious nation is Israel, you can make that case that they think... That they're at least partly still loyal to the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. Yep. But I mean, these are these are those that are worshiping not in spirit and not in truth. Correct. Is that the best way to put no it? No matter who it is. No matter who it is. Um, they're sacrificing in gardens. They're burning incense on bricks, sitting among the graves. Uh, they're spending the night in the cave tombs. Um Mine says in caverns, which yeah. is interesting. I find that interesting. Well, I mean, that reminds me of the of the the men in in the Decapolis area. You know, when Jesus goes across, right. Yeshua goes across the lake, 
and then heals them of their demon possession, and the demons goes into the the into the pigs. Interestingly enough, and, into the pigs. And and what comes next in this passage? <laughs> this is Isaiah sixty five. Demons are perfectly comfortable in pigs. Isaiah sixty five mm-hmm. verse four. They're sitting among the graves. They're spending the night in a cave. They're eating swine's flesh or pig's flesh, and the broth of detestable things is in their pots. So again, that's that's food, that's diet, that's that's the things that they're, they're told or they're not supposed to eat that they're eating anyway, whether as Gentiles or as Jews. You know, we're not supposed to be eating those things because he has declared those things are not food. Right. Um, but again, like you said, the, the demoniac, uh, where Yeshua goes across the lake, he, he casts out the demon, and he they has to go in the pigs. They ask. Because that pigs. unclean animal is is a, it's a perfect a, a, a home, perfect place for them, and they know it. Mm-hmm. So you do with that what you will. But so they are eating swine flesh, and the broth of detestable things is in their pots. Who say, "Keep to yourself, don't come to me, for I am holier than you." Mine says, "Keep your distance. <laughs> you know, stay away from me. I don't want to hear it." I don't want to hear it. Stop I talking. I don't. I, I don't want to hear the truth. I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear about uh, this other way, this good and pleasing way of the and, Lord. And, and, and the Israelites did that to the prophets, right? They they did that to Jeremiah specifically, mm-hmm. right? They did that to Isaiah. They, they they didn't just oh these are prophets. Listen to them, right? Yes, let's, no, let's, let's accept. They their were word. telling the prophets stop talking. You know, stop speaking in the name of the Lord to us. We don't want to hear it anymore. Unless it conforms with what we want to hear. Because they had other prophets telling them what their ears wanted to hear. Yeah. Well, what it's... makes that prophet any better than that prophet? Hmm. Well, is his word, is the prophet's word, number one, consistent with right. the word? Right. <clears throat> and does it come to pass right. as the prophet speaks? Right. And uh, sometimes you don't know until after the fact. Yeah, and they're living in real time, right? Hearing both sides, hearing both things. And they know what they want to hear, so they choose what they want to hear. And the rest, they're saying, stay away from me. We don't want to hear the truth. We don't want to hear that. Which is, of it's course, not what we want to hear. Which is, of course, how Paul describes it himself in Second Timothy uh, chapter 3. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, understand this. In the last days, hard times will come. For people will be, and you so tell me if you think this is a description <laughs> of the modern world, uh, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, hard-hearted, unforgiving, backbiting, without self-control, brutal, hating what is good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to an outward form of godliness, but denying its power. And he says, avoid these people. Keep your social distance away from them. (laughs) Um, They are always learning, yet never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Um, That's some of the ways that he describes them there. Um, Back in 1 Timothy, uh, he describes it. Oh, wait, I'm looking right over something, aren't I? What am I looking for? Oh, it's chapter four. Mm-hmm. Um, he says, For the time will come while they will not put up with sound instruction, but they will pile up for themselves teachers in keeping with their own desires to have their ears tickled, and they will turn away from hearing the truth and wander off into myths. Uh, so that's Isaiah is is basically saying a similar type of thing, mm-hmm. where he says, "Keep yes. to yourself. Don't come near to me, for I am holier than you. I am better than you. I don't need to hear about this other way. I have, you know, my culture's approval. Right. Why do you need me to? T- why do you t- trying to tell me to live some other way? Why do you want me to go backwards? Why are you judging me? Why do you want me to go do what they did hundreds of years ago? Mm-hmm. Right, all the way back there." I, I, I give have, I give money to the right causes. You know, I, I virtue signal better than you. Well, we, we have to remember, too, that for them, the Torah, right, the Mosaic Covenant was old-fashioned. Mm-hmm. Even in Isaiah's Even day. Even in Isaiah's day. 
it was back there. We've moved on. We've progressed. We're, we're beyond that now. Mm-hmm. We now have a king. We now have a temple. Right? Yeah. We have so, all these other other gods to choose from out there. So yeah. keep to yourself. Don't come near to me, for I am holier than that than you. And then you know, Gentiles would even have that a similar type of attitude in hearing the Torah for the first time. You know, in responding, we don't need to live that way. That look at look. I mean, look how Paul was received by the the philosophers in in Athens. They called him what a. a a seed picker or something else like that. They call him some derogatory term. Look, this guy thinks he's so smart. Uh, and then when he brings up the resurrection, they just like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. You know, so even the Gentiles can approach the the Torah and approach the word of God and, a, and a, an apostle of God in the same manner. And even Yeshua said at one point with when it comes to the Gentiles, what did he tell oh, them? No. The Gentiles like to lord it over, you know. They want to lord it over the Jewish people. And Yeshua specifically tells his disciples, don't be like that. That's not how you're to be. And don't let that happen. Right. That's also in the meaning in what he was saying. The Gentiles like to lord it over. Which uh, is exactly what the Inquisitions were. You, know, you think about the Inquisitions within history, like the Spanish Inquisition. So much of the Inquisition was specifically targeting Jews who had become believers, but were still doing Jewish things. Mm-hmm. And the Inquisitions used the fact that they were still doing those Jewish things as quote unquote evidence that they had not truly converted or didn't truly believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Mm-hmm. Right, so they were specifically targeting Jewish believers. Yep, because they had those holdovers of practice. Yes, yes. Uh, and that was even a big controversy uh, between what the the Roman Church and the Church in was it Scotland or Ireland? Ireland. 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 Uh, explain that one a little bit. Well, Ireland was what we would call more messianic. You know, they had more of those Jewish. You've, overtones and Jewish practices. You've heard of a guy named place. named St. Patrick? Have mm-hmm. y'all ever heard he of him before? He was much more messianic in nature. The Roman... Keeping, keeping the feasts? Right. Keeping Was he doing Sabbath too? Yes. Yes, he was. The The yes. Roman church didn't come into play on, on the islands of England and, and Ireland until a little bit later. And then they, they, they changed Patrick's identity and his practice, because there was a what was it? What's called the duo, the quarter quarter decimal controversy or whatever else was that it? About Easter? No, I'm I'm, I'm thinking between the what was the con? What did they call the description between Patrick and and the church? Yeah, I don't the know. Roman church. Okay. Fine. Okay. Well, the, the, um, because I'm thinking about the Easter controversy, so that's what I have in my head. But you know, I mean, I, I remember studying in seminary how Ireland specifically wanted to still connect the resurrection of Messiah to Passover and the Roman church did not. So they were still in Ireland practicing Passover and keeping Passover and unleavened bread and understood that resurrection was supposed to be in connection with that. The Roman church did not. And there was this huge controversy within the church within Europe and it was Ireland Lead, against Rome. Yeah, Ireland leading the charge. Patrick was not a a fan of the Roman or papal authority. No. He was he was fighting against that and trying to change that. Well, it wasn't even necessarily an issue, I don't think even for him yet entirely. So But the, he he resisted that that authority being imposed upon yes. him. And so he was not a champion. It took a while for that authority from Rome to that significant and go that far. Yes. I think that's the one thing we, we have a tendency not to realize. You know, we think that it instantly went from complete power from from the Roman Empire to the Roman Church. And that that transformation took time. Yes. And it definitely took time to go across all of what was the Roman Empire. Yes. What I'm real the point I'm really trying to make is that uh Patrick, as he was known at the time in his mm-hmm, day, mm-hmm. was on the other side of a lot of that 
of that he would have been yes. debate. Um, and a couple hundred years later, his his name and his identity was per- turned into a saint to be Saint Patrick and a champion by the Roman Church uh, to be a champion of those things that he was actually against in when he was alive. Right. So I just find that ironic. Um, but in any event. Uh, Isaiah 65, that was a nice little rabbit trail for you. <laughs> Isaiah 65, verse 5, keep to yourself, don't come near to, don't come to me, for I am holier than you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day. So that, that attitude of, mm-hmm. you know, I'm already, I'm good. I don't need any of this stuff. I don't need any of this ways of God that are pleasing to him. I'm holy as it is. You know, that's how God describes his response to that. When when believers or when people give the attitude of stay away from me, I am holier than you. Uh, he says, these are smoke in my nostrils. That's his response. When you are unwilling to submit yourself to my word, when you're unwilling to submit yourself to the way that is good and pleasing to me. fire that burns all day, yeah. Yeah. So, so... Okay, verse 6. Read verse 6. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but I will repay, even repay into their laps, your iniquities and their and the iniquities of your fathers together, says Adonai, because they burned incense on the mountains and scorned me on the hills, so I will measure into their laps full wages for their former deeds. Hmm. Does your say anything no. in there? Okay. I mean, and obviously he's not talking about the incense on his mountain. Correct. He's talking about worship that's not in his. That's not been prescribed way. Right. That he lies lays out in his scripture because right. the that kind of incense and burning of things and sacrifice and offerings is only supposed to happen in one place. Right. That's in Jerusalem. That's at his tabernacle or at his temple. Correct. And of course, in Isaiah's day, the temple is there and functioning and operating. Um, verse 8 says, Thus says Adonai, as new wine is found in a cluster, and one says, Do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it. So I will do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob, an heir of my mountains from Judah. My chosen ones shall inherit it, and my servants will dwell there. Uh, Sharon will be a fold of flocks and the valley of Achor, a place for herds to lie down in. For my people who seek me. So now he's talking about, he's talking about those that are his, that are seeking him. But you who forsake Adonai, who for, forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for fortune, who fill cups of mixed wine for fate. And I like the way this passage does a turn with it. Who fill cups of mixed wine for fate, I will fate you (laughs) uh, uh, to the sword. You know, if you think that uh, there's that random fate or these other gods, fake luck, whatever else, uh, astronomy, you know, not astronomy, but astrology uh, is, is in guidance of your life and not me. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about fate. I'm going to, I'll take the, the reins and show you. And the church who want to claim Jesus and at the same times are following their horoscope. Mm-hmm. You want to make sure they let, hit, you know, see what their horoscope's going to say today. And that's just, that's, that's not the way of God. Mm-mm. So I will fate you to the sword, and all of you will kneel to slaughter. For I called, and here's the problem. When we are not keeping, when we're not walking in his way, you know, there's the scripture that talks about, can two walk together unless they be agreed? agreed. All right. The good thing about when you are walking together and you are in agreement, when one person says something, you can hear it. You know, I, I, I get into trouble sometimes. My wife may be, I may be sitting here where I'm at right now, and my wife may be in the room, a couple of rooms over, and she says something, and nothing happens. 
Uh, and so then I can get in trouble because I don't hear her. But the reason why I don't hear her is I'm not right next to her. You know, you know how that goes? Mm -hmm. You know, just because you say something don't mean I'm going to hear it. Because if we're not walking together, if we're not side by side, if we're not near one another, then speaking in a normal tone of voice is not going to be heard. And so in order for her, for me to hear her from down at the other end of the house, she has to raise her voice. But the main point of that passage, how, unless they be agreed, is the agreement. Yes. And the agreement that, that, that that's, that's talking, talking about. about are the ways of God. Unless we're both walking according to the ways of God, how, how can we, we're, we're not walking together. Right. We're, we're not walking together. We're not going together if we're not walking according to the ways of God. That's, you know, again, uh, 1 John 2, 6 says that we are to live as Yeshua lived, mm -hmm. right? And so, and, and that's the whole concept of a disciple, mm -hmm. right? A disciple walks behind their rabbi and everything the rabbi does, the disciple wants to do. How they walk, how they talk, how they eat, what they wear, what they eat. Everything that the rabbi does or the master does, the disciple or student wants to do. Mm -hmm. And that's supposed to be our relationship with Yeshua. Everything he did, we're right there behind him. Mm -hmm. Because he's already established back in verse 3, I'm sorry, verse 2, that the, we are a people who walk in a way that is not good. So if we're walking in a way that is not good, that means we're not walking. We're going according to our own inclination. What right. seems good to us? What right. seems right to us? So we're not walking right? with we're, him. We're walking away and he keeps going straight. And so when he calls, right, which is where we're at right. in uh, um, verse 12, for I called, but you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not hear. Why not? Because we're walking a different path. We're not in we're agreement away. with him. We're walking uh, on our own way. And so you did what was evil in my sight and chose what I did not delight in. And that's an important concept. You know, we should be wanting to choose those things that are, that delight him, mm. that he, that please him. Yes. Uh, and how do we know what pleases him? How do we know what he takes delight in? That's a fundamental question. And we know what pleases him and what delights him. What What is the way that is pleasing to him mm -hmm. is through his word, through his Torah, his instructions. You know, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. Mm -hmm. um, to, what is else? Oh, now I just lost the beginning of it. To, to love. What? To Mer love mercy, mercy to walk justly, justly love, love mercy, mercy and, and walk, walk humbly, humbly with, with your God. God. <laughs> I got stuck. Which got me stuck. Yeah. It's all your fault. So, <laughs> just say, okay. See, that's my fault. So, um, so anyway, the, those are the things. And all of those ideas of, of justice, of mercy, and humble humility, those are all things that Scripture defines. And these are things that God is saying is going to be seen up until the time he returns. Because the very next verse is leading us right into the new heavens and new earth. And that's not the new heavens and new earth of eternity. It's the new heavens and new earth of the kingdom. That mm -hmm. thousand year reign of Messiah. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so we better get moving. Yes. Therefore, thus says Adonai Elohim... Behold, my servants will eat while you will go hungry. Behold, my servants will drink, but you will be thirsty. Behold, my servants will rejoice. And he defines my servants as the ones who, oh, where was it? Who, my servants will dwell there. My chosen ones will inherit it. Um, my people who seek me, mm. right? Versus the ones that forsake Adonai. Those who hear his voice. Right. Right? Who listen when he, when he calls. But my servants will rejoice, but you will be put to shame. Behold, my servants will sing for joy with a happy heart, but you will cry from pain of heart and wail out of a broken spirit. You will leave your name behind as a curse for my chosen ones, and Adonai Elohim will slay you. He will call his servants by another name, 
So he who says a bracha, or blessing, in the land will be blessed by the God of truth. And he who swears in the land will swear by the God of truth. For so the truth is important. Truth is important. Uh, and that's the word, uh, probably the Hebrew word emet. I can look that up. Mm -hmm. Truth is. Uh, but the former troubles are forgotten because they are hidden from my sight. And those former troubles are the consequences for their sin. Right? Yes. And that's, that's, you know, he's talking about, you know, their sin in 64 and 65 and, and our sin. And there's consequences to those things. Right? So much of the tribulation is not just going to be to punish the nations, but it's also going to be there to discipline his people, God's people, whether we be Jew or Gentile. It will be, it's, it's, it's also coming to discipline us because we have not been who he has called us to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's people, you know, will talk about, you know, Jesus is coming back. Could be any day, could be any day. And are we really ready? Has the bride made herself ready? Has, has the prayer of Jesus in John 17 been answered? And that primary, Are we ready for that reunion? That primary prayer being that as a call for for us to be one unity and unity, especially True between unity. Jew and Gentile. Yes. So I mean, those things have not been accomplished, and and so much of of that will be accomplished by the pressing of the tribulation. Mm hmm. So, and with that, the former troubles, remember this, she the, just said the, the former, former troubles, troubles are, are, is our rebellion. Is our rebellion and the consequences of that rebellion, the discipline of God, mm -hmm. right? So he says in verse 17, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered or come to mind. So, and the, 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 the kind new... Of, kind of like a, a, a woman in labor. You know, once that child is born, she forgets that hard labor. You know, yeah, okay, it was there, but free with that, I have my child. Yes. Right? She's not going to focus on, she may have her stories, but the focus of her life becomes the child. Mm -hmm. And the, the new heavens and the new earth are for right. those who are his servants, those mm -hmm. who are seeking his face, those who are hearing his voice when he calls. Um. Verse 18, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For behold, I am creating Jerusalem for rejoicing mm. and her people for joy. And that is language of what feast primarily? Oh, that, that would be Sukkot. Yeah, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. The, 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 the theme and the primary message of those of Sukkot or Tabernacles is that of joy and rejoicing. Celebration. We are, we are commanded to mm -hmm. rejoice at the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of the Nations, mm -hmm. right? And of and, course, we see that in Zechariah 14, that feast being mentioned in the kingdom specifically, yes. right? And so, you know, we're not one in, in terms of... Uh, living the messianic life we're not wanting to go backwards we're wanting to go forward these things are still in our future mm -hmm. we're trying to prepare the, our hearts and our lives for what's coming yes the path of god the walk of god is not just you know the torah of instruction of god is not just in the past right the torah of god is also the kingdom in the future right. it's part of the new heavens and the new earth mm -hmm. Because everything will be his. Everything will be done his way. There will be no rebellion anymore. There will be no going our own way anymore. Well, there will be, but, you know, when there is, it's dealt with pretty it's... much immediately <laughs> by the king himself. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, yeah. uh, I, I'm creating Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for joy. Then I will rejoice mm. in Jerusalem. So, in the kingdom... You know, the Messiah himself is also rejoicing with his people. So the heart of God is rejoicing and celebrating with that time. Nick, the, his mind says, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and take joy in my people. And be glad in my people, right. yes. 
No longer will the voice will the voice of weeping or the voice of crying be heard in her. Does that sound in like Jerusalem? Yeah, in that holy city. Yeah, does that not sound like Revelation? Mm, amen. No more tears or crying. But there is a difference between this description of the new heavens and new earth and the one in Revelation twenty one, and that's how we know. We'll get to it in just a minute, but that's how we know this is about the millennial reign and the one in Revelation is about eternity. Yes. Because so, there is a difference. So we'll get to that in just a we'll, minute. We'll, this actually, this next verse okay. in a lot Go of ways. Ahead. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few mm -hmm. days uh, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the youth will die at a hundred years, but one who misses the mark of a hundred must be accursed. Cursed. So that's that's one reason why we know this death is not is eternity. There. there is some measurement or some sense of death. Right. And in, and of course in eternity there death is going to be gone. The one in Revelation where he talks about new heaven and new earth, death is gone. Mhm. Mm Forever. But here but even the idea of if someone doesn't live to be 100, they're thought of as as cursed. To be cursed, biblically speaking, meant something. Yes, it did because, and that was that goes back to the Torah, mm -hmm. uh, because he says, "Today I set before you life and death, blessing, blessing and, and cursing. cursing." And what is that that he is setting before them that defines those things? Oh, the Torah itself. It's the Torah. It's his instruction. Mm -hmm. So to be accursed is to be in rebellion. To take those things of the breaking of his Torah. Mm -hmm. And everything that God said he would do, if you break it, there you go. It's the consequence of not living by his Torah. Right. That's what being accursed is mm -hmm. in Scripture. Yes. Um, so that's important to know. Um, verse 21, it says, They will build houses and inhabit them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Because these are, these are some of those examples of when you're blessed, in the kingdom, these are the things that are going to happen for you. Mm -hmm. When you're cursed, these are the things that don't happen for you. Right. And he uses some of these exact same examples. Uh, you'll, they'll plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit, nor plant and another eat. For, the, for like the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people, and my chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor bear children for calamity. For they are the offspring of those blessed by Adonai, as well as descendants with them. So in the, you're, you're having multiple generations yes. that are living together. Uh, they're not going to die off before getting to meet each other. So even in that millennial reign. No more stillborn babies. Yeah. Nothing like that. Yeah. Not even really. I mean, you get the impression from reading the scriptures that somebody who is alive almost regardless of what their age is, when the millennium starts, right. they will very much be alive by the end of it. It's possible. It, would, it, it will be possible. It will be possible for mm -hmm. them to be alive yes. at the end of the thousand years. Mm -hmm. um, so you could have, can you imagine all of those generations being together? And not corrupting each other, but being there to support one another in the ways of God. You know, and, and after the fall, those generations, and to a large extent, for the most part, corrupted each other. Mm -hmm. And right? found all the different you evil things to do. very narrow thread of, of generations that lived that long who stayed very loyal. But for the most part across humanity, those generations that lived so long corrupted each other. Mm-hmm. And so that's not going to be the case anymore. Inventing ways of doing evil. Right. So they, they are the offspring of those blessed by Adonai as well as descendants with them. And it will come to pass that before they call, and this is, this is his description of the kingdom. Again, this is what the millennium is going to be like. This is what the living in the kingdom under the rule of Messiah will be like. This is what we're supposed to be looking forward to. This is supposed to be part of our hope mm -hmm. this is this is what we should be getting excited about absolutely and listen to it he says it will come to pass that before they call i will answer and while they are still speaking i will hear i mean can you imagine 
Number one, if in the in the millennial kingdom, what kind of prayer are we going to be offering? Are we going to be offering any kind of prayer that's contrary to his will? No. No. So we're, every, everything that we ask in his name, right? What does he say? What does Yeshua done. promise? It will be done. So in the millennium, all of our prayer will be answered because all of it will be in, in submission to him. All of it will be in his name, consistent with his will, consistent with his purpose, consistent, you know, not tainted by sin, selfishness or anything else. And so what he told us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven will actually be happening. And and that's what we'll be asking for. Yes. And he says, before you even ask, I'm going to I'm going to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. OK, we're there. <laughs> yeah, before you even get it finished with it praying, it's already done. Yeah. That's that's what life in the millennium is going to be like. That's what life in the kingdom under the reign of Messiah is going to be like. Uh, so, and then he describes this in twenty five, and this should be similar language uh, that you you've heard in different ways. But the wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. But and notice this one. This was interesting. Dust will be the serpent's food. Things aren't changing for the serpent. Yeah, that hasn't changed a bit. That was exactly what God said was going to be his curse. Forever. Uh, forever. So Satan, you know, the serpent, uh, his, his situation has not changed. Mm -hmm. He is still limited and controlled by God. You know, he can't just go to and fro and do whatever he wants. He is still under the super, direct supervision. Well, he's you know. in a, Satan is in the pit at this point. Yes. Yes, but I mean, he he is still but, he is not his own master. No, he's not so been the, released. The he's not yeah. he's not free to do whatever. No, but the the serpent, the one who allowed Satan to use him, mm -hmm. is still under the consequences of that decision. Mm -hmm. So they will not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain, says Adonai. So the, the, the serpents, it's interesting because we just read about the serpents um, coming and, and biting and killing God's people, right? In that's the wilderness. In, that's in Numbers and, chapter 21. And people talk about that event as... As the miracle, all of a sudden the, that these snakes were all of a sudden there, as if that's the miracle. No, and I heard somebody, uh, Rabbi Hirschberg, actually talk about this recently. I said, no, the, the miracle is actually that God was keeping those serpents away from them all along. Because those, those serpents were always there in the wilderness. They didn't just immediately, you know, instantaneously appear out of nowhere. They had always been there. Mm-hmm. But God had been keeping them away from his people. Rendering them effectively harmless. Right. While his hand of protection was over the people, the snakes could not harm them. Right. But when he lifts his hand of protection, then the serpents will bite and be poisonous, be deadly. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's, that is... An amazing thing. There are so many things that God protects us from Amen. that we're never even aware that there was a hazard in the first place. Uh, so that's a, that's just an important thing for us to keep in mind that it's his lifting of his hand of protection that oftentimes is what begins to cause our problem. You know, the Romans talks about how he gave people over to their lusts and their desires mm -hmm. And it's the giving them over that they spiral down even further. They're already going this way, but he's, you know, he's been limiting them so far. But when they get to a certain point, he's like, okay, you, you want to go that path? Here you go. And my protection or my limiting has even stepped away. But the kingdom, I mean, that's just, that's, mm. the kingdom is something glorious. The kingdom is something beautiful and something to be looked forward to. Yeah, that's, that's the bottom line. That's, of that's our redemption. We're longing for our redemption to be complete. Yes, the payment for our redemption has been made, and that payment is complete and paid in full. But we have not realized the full 
payment on, uh, that we receive in our redemption yet. You know, I mean, we still live in a world full of sin. We still live in decaying, dying bodies. We're looking forward to the glorification. We're looking forward to the king being on the throne. We're looking forward to eventually going into eternity and being with the Father, right? These, these things are going to take place over time. Yes, so are. we are still groaning for our full redemption and everything that means. The earth itself, the heavens are, are groaning and longing for their redemption, mm -hmm. for all these things to take place. For the sons of God to, to be, be revealed. revealed. And so these, th this is something that we should be looking forward to. And so when we talk about the kingdom and when we talk about what's in the kingdom, and we talk about preparing and practicing and having those dress rehearsals for the kingdom, right? Because the main event will one day be. And so we want to be ready for that main event. And so much of our life now in Messiah is preparation for that main event. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not about our comfort here and what we want to do now. It's God getting us ready for when his son is on the throne. Mm -hmm. He wants us to be on the path that pleases him yes. now. Yes. It doesn't have to wait no. until the king is on the throne. He, he wants us to be walking with him now so we can be in agreement with him, so we mm -hmm. can hear his voice when he calls so that that our, our prayer will be in accordance with his will and you know as as much as possible in our in our situation of still corrupted in some ways because we are ambassadors of this kingdom this is yeah. the kingdom we're ambassadors yeah. of yeah we're not ambassadors of the united states of america we're ambassadors of the kingdom of god and right. it is it is something real and one day it will be on this earth yeah and so you know sometimes we have to remind ourselves you know it's not our job to get a certain political candidate elected president we that's, may have our views and our perspectives but that's not really our our primary goal and function our right. primary goal and function is to say hey the king is coming mm -hmm. and you want to be one of those people who calls on his name you want to be one of his servants you who will inherit uh all of this blessing you want your gar you know your wedding garments on yeah. right <laughs> yeah the proper wedding garment so he is the one that we are supposed mm -hmm. to be advocating for most of all right. that kingdom is the one that we are supposed to be celebrating and rejoicing in anticipation of and so that's what i just want to encourage y'all in it's the he's talking about a new heavens and a new earth where our sins and our things are not remembered anymore where um where you know he, before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. And as we've talked about earlier in Isaiah, this is also a kingdom of complete and true justice. Yes. And righteousness. And where everything that is wrong is made right. And we have a, we as a human beings have a hunger and thirst for true righteousness. We know when it's as people we as, should. Well, yes. But we understand that what we're getting is not it. Yes. You know, what we are seeing, what we are experiencing in, in the world, even as, as good as a system the, as we, you might see on the planet, guess what? There's still going to be injustice somewhere in some way. Yeah. You know, the, the innocent are still going to be convicted. The, the, the guilty are still going to uh, be set free. We're not going to be able to get everything right. So we have a heart. Uh, and I hunger for true justice. And that's going to be a defi defining mark of his throne. Yeah. And of course, um, it's going to be justice as he defines it. <laughs> He's not going to be asking our opinion right. about whether something was just or not. He is going to make the right decision. It's not going to be up to a jury? Nope, no jury. <laughs> not a jury. In that sense. Yeah. So, All right. Well, lots of things to think about and talk about. And then if you really want to get ahead, look into Isaiah 66 uh, and some of those things of what's in there.
Because some of the issues that we talked about tonight are going to show up in here, I think, yeah. in Isaiah 66, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, but also some things that we have seen in our generation mm. or shortly before our generation. So, so stop trying to get ahead right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And say goodnight. <laughs> so it's good to see everybody here tonight. May the Lord bless y'all. And look forward to seeing you again. Don't forget to come by and visit us on Shabbat. Uh, we're meeting at 1 o'clock in, in Morristown, Tennessee. Uh, if you have any more questions and things, go to our website, www.restorationmessiah.com. And we'd love to hear from you. May the Lord bless y'all. Shalom. Shalom.